Tonight, our demonstration is by Ray Cole. Ray is talking about the opportunity he had through EOG to do a three day, five day, five day workshop with David Ellsworth at Anderson Ranch. Um, so, Ray, take it away. Oh, well, hello. Thanks, thanks everybody. That was a, it was a really great opportunity. And uh, so I thought I'd briefly talk about the setting of Anderson Ranch. Um, Anderson Ranch is up in uh, Snowmass, and it's right along this golf course. And I was taking walks like every day. It was, just, it was incredible. It was so pretty up there. Um, the housing up there is uh, two, bedroom, two people per bedroom and four people per bathroom. Uh, and uh, if you ever take a class up there, I'd highly recommend getting off campus housing. Uh, <laughs> it doesn't work real well. Uh, the food up there, uh, you probably hear me talk about that all night. They had this, they had this year, I don't know how often it changes, this Korean chef. And I never ate such good food every meal in my life for a week. Oh my God. <laughs> she was so good, and the food just was, you just, it was just very healthy, very tasteful. Man, it was good food. Uh, cost a little bit hot. Uh, the instruction, though, they have all kinds of art things going on up there uh, with people like Calvary and David Ellsworth. And um, after the course, the one thing I'll say about David Ellsworth is how could you not learn something from this guy? He's been, he told me he'd been turning wood for 50 years. And you know, every time they talk about a bunch of demonstrators, you know, like at the symposium, they say, well, they're like 350 years worth of experience here, and half of it is David Ellsworth's. <laughs> and, and, but it's, it's pretty much true. Um, he's, he's really an amazing guy. And if you want a reference to how he does things, this is the book right here. And it's got a lot of good, solid information. And it's called How to Make My Master Creates Bowls, Pots, and Vessels. And um, the thing that I, like I was pointing out in the instant gallery, David Ellsworth, he was the one that started carving and painting wood. And <coughs> That's been a very big trend in wood turning for quite a few years now. But the thing that's interesting is he's kind of dropped that. He's back to what can you find in the wood? And he, he basically does most of his work out in Pennsylvania and spends his summer uh, up here in, in um, at, what's that? Allen's Park. Park. Allen's Park, yeah. And. Uh, he, he didn't think some of the things he does would work out here. The thing that he does that's really interesting is uh, with spalted woods. And one of the things that he does is he roughs out a bunch of hollow forms that he's going to make, throws them in a bag with a bunch of chips from a spalted log he's been turned and then sets it off in the corner for a month or two. And then he's got the spalting right where he wants it. And he finishes them up and that makes nice pieces out of them. But he, he, he really has an eye for picking how to use a piece of wood to, to get the coolest effect out of it. And uh, when I came home, uh, my neighbor down the street was taking down a tree and I thought, I need some wood. You know? And I went down there and I got the log from him. And it was too big. And uh, to really handle, I, I had it in my truck, but I just started blocking it up out of the back of my truck and uh, putting it in kitchen bags. And uh, about a month later, this is what I found. It was getting all moldy. Or it was, you know, it started to turn. And some of the pieces had more, more in them than others. Some of them had little roots growing on them. I turned them loose down here. No. <laughs> but, <laughs> But at uh, any rate, uh, I think it really, the same thing would work here. It's just that, you know, in Pennsylvania, it's a lot wetter. And you, 
it just happens. But here you're going to have to do something like throw it in a plastic bag in a warm place. You're going to get the same thing. So, um, but what he does is you really got to pick the wood, how or what you're going to do with the wood in a manner that gets the most out of it. And I've had a few pieces that have turned out good because I got lucky and and it would be a little pine and got the, the yellow and the blue in the right places. Um, but he, he does things like, he makes a lot of these little spirit, spirit vessels that are about the size of an orange. And he likes to use uh, black ash burl because the um, features are just the right size for small objects. And so that's part of picking your wood. How big of a piece can you make out of it? Out of something that's beetle kill pine, you can make something that's this big that can look pretty cool. But if you're trying to make something the size of a softball, it's just going to be a blue piece of wood because the features are too big in the small thing in that case. Um, so a lot of it is, is picking the wood and using it in a way that uh, makes it really interesting. The other thing that he does is he uses entirely green wood uh, because the thing that's really interesting about green wood is you can get it to warp in neat ways when the way, the way that you uh, turn it. One of the students in the class, he was from up in the Northwest and he was retired ship's cook, and if you look up ship's, ship's cook in uh, Webster's Dictionary, his picture will be there. And, and it's just the way he looked. But he turned this uh, just shallow bowl out of um, uh, hackberry that looked so boring at the first of the week that I just went, oh yeah, so what? By the end of the week, it had warped to where on the ends there were these two little divots that went up like that. And it looked so cool. But it was because he, took, he knew what that wood would do because he turns a lot of green wood. And it just was a really neat looking bowl. So that's one of the reasons that you want to use green wood. Some kinds of wood that are green, like Madrone, will work every day, every direction, but <laughs> what you would expect. And I've never turned it, but I've seen pieces made out of it. Um, but the, the thing about picking the wood, like especially this guy up in the Northwest, he uses a, a McNaughton tool a lot. But he says, I only use a McNaughton tool to core things in a hurry. So I can get on with making the bowl that I'm interested in, or the piece that I'm interested in making this thing. He says, 98% of the time, the core won't make something cool. It won't have the right proportions of color, so he just pitches it and turns into firewood. Um, of the people that, it, there were several people in the class that had just go every year, one guy's been there probably 10 times or something, and they basically, they are, all they do is turn green wood. Uh, they, they don't, like when I learned to turn bowls, you roughed them out, dried them, and then turned them. And they don't get a perfectly round bowl or near perfect and it won't move much. But the thing that's interesting is going all the way to the finish with green wood. So, uh, things that make green wood work are one is that you gotta basically, let's see what I write down. Um, you got to turn it thin. You need to pay attention to where the pith is. In the case of the really cool bowl I was talking about, the guy had uh, aligned the pith just perfectly so that the, the two edges came out the same. And so the other thing is you got to get something on it right away after you get it off, off your leg. And that's like put it in a paper bag, put it in a plastic bag, uh, David puts mineral spirits on it and then throws it aside and just lets it dry <coughs> for a month. And in a month, all the mineral spirits will be gone out of the piece, but so will the water, and it won't 
have cracked. I haven't tried that yet. Mineral spirits or mineral oil? Um, yeah, I was thinking it could be mineral oil, but I didn't think mineral oil evaporated. Doesn't. It does. Well, huh? I don't. I don't think it does. Not that much. It does or it doesn't. It does evaporate. Does. Mm -hmm. Leaves no film after about a month. Yeah, so that's, I, I think it might have been mineral oil, but I, I don't remember exactly, I have to go back to my notes. Yeah, Tom? Did, did you say you put that on to keep from splitting? Yeah, because it doesn't dry too fast. Just to slow the moisture. Slows how fast the water gets out. Is he brushing it on or just soaking it? I don't know, I didn't see him do it, he just said get some on there. <laughs> And, uh, but, um, so the way the, the class started out is we all showed up there Monday morning and had breakfast and went up to the wood turning studio by the lady he picked out. And he brings it over to the whiteboard and he draws this picture up there. A very shallow bowl, uh, a kind of an open bowl, a little bit of a closed bowl, and a hall form. And he says, I want you to make me one of each of these this week. And what he would do is he'd walk by, by once in a while if you were doing something stupid. Uh, <laughs> he would go, you know, Ray, if you just turned your gown this way a little bit, it'd go a whole lot better. Boy, you turned it that way and me and everything went way better. <laughs> and uh, so you, you really got a lot out of it. I, I turned a lot of bowls. Um, and I thought, uh, I, I'm, I'm a candidate for this class. And after being there for a day, I thought, have I ever turned a bowl before? <laughs> because I was learning so much from him so fast. Um, basically, the way he starts out turning a bowl is he puts things between centers. And I brought my own stuff in. And... Uh, the bigger the center that you have, the better, because that gives you something to get a hold of and turn it. And you can, um, so I, I got, I don't know, I got this at one of the symposiums, 2012, I think. Dan Bailey turned me on to it. It was, I think the guy that makes stubby lays or something made it. But anyway, uh, this is what I use. And it, it, the reason that you want to put it between centers is that you can adjust it a little bit before you're really ready to go and uh, and get the wood just the way you want it to be. Um, the other thing that's um, oh, let's talk about the tools before we go on too far because this is a big deal. Um, the Ellsworth gouge is. Um, this is an Ellsworth gouge, and it sharpened correctly. And you notice those l l ears go halfway up the gouge. Put you hold it up to your yeah. hand. Here, I'll put it on here so I can hold it still. Okay. And it's um, it's much, much more ears than you're going to see. Still having a hard time focusing. Could you just put your hand behind it? There. And it um, basically, what it ends up doing is, is those long ears end up being really useful. And the thing that you, there's a couple of things that you can do with this gouge that I don't know that you can do with any other gouge. Uh, one is because of the way they're shaped, you end up turning with the gouge in this orientation, which is basically flat. And the reason that that's an advantage is you got all the force that's going down into the tool rest. You're not working so hard. And uh, that's one thing. The other thing that is really, really a big deal on this gouge is that when you put it on the inside of the bowl, you can make a cut that is equivalent to putting a skew on the, on the outside of a piece on the spindle lathe. And, and it's because of the way the steel uh, meets the wood. And you can get a cut on the inside of a bowl that uh, nearly doesn't 
need sanding. It's pretty amazing. Now, what do you have on there? Huh? What's the angle that you use? The angle of the bevel here is 60 degrees. Yeah, steep. Uh, but. Right. 60 on the nose. Yeah. But the wings are a lot sharper. Yeah, and they're like nearly flat. This is his jig, and it works on a Wolverine system. And you basically got to have this jig to go with this gouge to sharpen it that way. And it sharpens correctly because this particular gouge is a true parabolic flute. And that's uh, what makes it be a nice even edge all the way up. Now, this was the gouge that I had before I went to the pro course. And this is a, a really good piece of steel. It's a Thompson tool and I liked it a lot. Um, the, the, I don't know if you can see it there. Let's see if I can turn it. But you can kind of see the front. There's kind of a little bird beak on it. Yeah. And that little bird beak happens because the way this gouge, this flute, is ground, it's a half circle with two lines coming off. And I ground this on the um, I mean, I, I sharpened it with the Ellsworth jig, thinking I could get away with it. Well, for about six weeks, I had a bruised rib that was reminding me of how that doesn't work <laughs> because of a catch that it caused. Because it's just a little bit catchy when you have that little, uh, anything that uh, makes a curve that goes like this down on your tool, it's going to make it catchy. And so, that, that's a problem. Now, if I had sharpened this to be a bottom cutter, it would have come out just fine, because his bottom cutting tool is 85 degrees right here. And uh, the, uh, and then I just sharpened it on using his uh, jig to put a little bit of a wing on it. And that does the last little bit of the bowl, especially a deep bowl, um, from um, uh, that you can't really reach into. On a shallow bowl, you can do almost the whole bowl with the 60 degree gouge. But this will always clean up the bottom. And uh, he introduced me to that, and it was just amazing. I should have brought that piece with me. But it just, it was a very deep bowl and it just was perfect all the way down and it was, I was just, uh, but it was because of the way that the tool is made. And uh, I think, I think that one thing that we as wood turners don't spend enough time on is understanding how to sharpen your tool and getting it consistent. Uh, the sharpening is the biggest deal. And uh, my brother and I, my brother picked up some used uh, tools that were this exact same tool, same steel, same flute. And the way they were sharpened, it was just crap. And I took and I cleaned it up and, and set it up the way it's supposed to be set up uh, with uh, this jig and uh, made a good tool out of it again. And he got them for. 10 bucks and I spent 100 bucks. <laughs> but still, it was a good deal. Now, um, the uh, sharpening, I, before I went to the course, had been using, and I still have, a, a Sorby sandpaper system. And that sanding system for sharpening tools jumped my wood turning up a notch because I was getting tools so much sharper and consistent. Uh, when I was at the course, uh, they had a CBM wheel there to sharpen your tool on. And of course, it was a Wolverine jig, and we were all using uh, this, this jig on it with your tool. And basically, you'd set it, there was a little block where you'd set it two inches out, and then just stick it in there and sharpen it. And uh, I never, ever got a tool as sharp 
as one of those CBM wheels. Yeah, I know they cost like 200 bucks plus. And David Ellsworth's, the one that he has, he likes to use, is 180 grit. And um, so I know some of them go up to 400 grit, and he says that's too fine. You don't get the burr that you want. But what I do know is when I was went back to my lathe and started just turning after using that um, tool, I, or that sharpening system, I had never cut with that sharp of a tool before. And I, I brought tonight a piece, this is cottonwood. Now, I don't know how many of you guys have turned cottonwood, but cottonwood basically sucks. <laughs> it, it's a hard wood to turn, but on the other hand, if your tools are scary sharp, it, it, it turns like maple. And so, um, that's one of the things I got out of the course was how to get your sh tools really sharp for phenomenal feed. <laughs> you have to find that fancy gear. So, um, right. Yeah. Those, those wheels are a little more expensive up front, but they're cheaper in the long run because they don't wear out. out. Yeah. 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 They, yeah. Also, you don't have to balance your. I know. They're perfectly balanced. They're so beautiful. Yeah. There's. I know. There's. It's just sticker shock. <laughs> <laughs> there's a fellow back in Georgia that's got wood turning wonders, and you can get two wheels from him. Literally for the cost of one, they're just as good quality as the Raptors that, that uh, you can find elsewhere. So he's got a pretty good thing going for him. He's heads up on that. There's the wheels. Yeah, the ones that were designed by David, and I'm trying to think of the name of the company that they come from, but they have radiuses on the corners and it's really wide. I had to take the guards off of my uh, grinder to get them to fit. But the little radius is on the side. Um, let you um, sharpen little like hollowing tools. Um, that, and, I'll, and I'll speak briefly about hollowing, which I'm not going to demonstrate, but that's to make this for. Um, I hated David Ellsworth's tool. <laughs> he just sticks uh, like a giant uh, ant Allen wrench in there that's been sharpened. And you've got to handle all the torque with your hands. And he likes that because he knows what's happening with it. And it would take me quite a bit of practice, but um, I really like tricks. Hollowing tools the best. <laughs> and and uh, that's just because I've used them and I understand them. But boy, the, and the thing about David is like when he wasn't watching us, he was over in his leg and he was making these little spirit forms and he had these little bitty hollowing tools made out of Allen wrenches. And I uh, walked by him one day and I said, you know, if you made that hole a little bigger, it'd be a lot easier. <laughs> and he looked up at me and laughed. <laughs> but, he, you know, the hole is the size of the Allen wrench. He, he really, really a talented man. Um, so, yeah, that's basically it for that. Um, there's really what I, you know, got out of it is you don't need dry wood, you want green wood. Uh, you don't really even need a bandsaw. You just need a half log and a blade big enough to swing it. And um, so that's what I brought in. Um, and um, it's, I took the bark off just because the guy in the front row might get mad at me, but didn't want to hurt anybody. So it was pretty well coming off anyway. Obviously, this is a foreign lathe to me, or maybe I'm foreign lathe, I'm not sure which. What do you have for a lathe, Brad? I have a big mark, 300. So basically, I already marked this log up before I came in, and I just put an X in the center, and then put a put a hole that I could get my uh, 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 
would have drive, uh, started it. What I'm looking at right now is it's not quite square, um, and it's going to be a little off side of here. We'll get that fixed pretty quick. But that's closer than I thought. That corner's out. Well, three out of four are in, so I'm going to go with it. <laughs> so basically, I just crank it up here, and um, that should give us something to start with. See if it's going to be able to go around with. Oh, I don't want to use that other guy. Hey, is our insurance paid? <laughs> You have to talk to the treasurer. He's not in his head, so yeah. You know, it's like over on this side. You get the speed knob all the way to the right, right? right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the right way, isn't it? Right now. We could not have another road. Too high. Well, I can't quite fit this puppy in there. I'm going to write back to the little one. Somewhere in there, I'll get about right. Alright. Okay, so, um, oh, this is way. way. Sure, I'll fix that here pretty quick. What the So you can hear it ticking there. I'm not really quite in the way anymore. Yeah. Now that's a lot better to see the, the big um, rhythm start to come off.
So we're about to get out of the square here. I'm going to have to move this out a little bit so I can reach out here. Let's check this again. chucks, you know, one for every possible jaw. David says you need one chuck and one jaw. Now he fastens wood. You just basically, this is my little three inch um, chuck. But you only need one big set of jaws, you know, like a four inch one. And you get a hold of it with that. And then you design your bowl so that the foot is in front of the jaw and you can take it down wherever you want. And that way you can see the whole bowl when you're making it. And you only need one jaw. The other way is that he fastens wood on small, small pieces. He does a lot of uh, uh, using glue, uh, glue blocks. And he just glues the nice wood to a piece of to a glue box that he just uses over and over until it's gone. And it can either be on a face plate or you can put threads in it. And, and that's what you do. But for now, what I've been doing is, is I just measure about how big it, my jaw is. And you see, I got a ways to go before I'm going to get down to where I can make a tendon. Um, so. But it will get there pretty quick. Pull the Close 
close as I've come. But I, I still like the Dan Daly method, where this is where you use a skew or a bowl, and you just go in there and flatten it out. Clean it up to the angle you need. Now, what is true about this is it's way thicker than what this can stand, so I gotta take some of that off. Spindle turning, elbow height is about right. But for bowl turning, David says you really should have the spindle about three inches lower than your elbow, and for hollow turning, about four inches lower than your elbow. And he said he'd never turn on the big mark again because they were too high, too tall. He liked robust. To, but, um, you know, I've got a solution for that, and that's I'm just going to make some pallets to lay around my legs. <laughs> Makes me taller, it'll work. It's a lot cheaper too. <laughs> uh, so, okay, I got this where I can put it on a chuck. I don't have a very nice form yet, but we'll fix that here pretty quick. But again, this is where I use a, use a skew. Is I got this little nubbin I want to get rid of. And so I just take my, my skew and uh, pop it off. See, any wood turner can use a skew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think it's good for opening paint cans. Yeah. How does this work? Like yeah. that, so if it's a two handed operation, kind yeah. of. Yeah, and then you can move oh, over a little bit. You know, I think I forgot my. What do you need? Uh, Allen wrench for my. I forgot my Allen wrench for my. Put it Key. Oh, so we should have one. Alan, in the grinder case. What brand is it? Vicmark. It's, it's a big one, it's a small Vicmark, so it takes a, an 8 millimeter rather than a 10. Okay. Yeah. You have to your hat. I've got an 8 millimeter Allen wrench if we need it to. shape now and we're going to could have made that a little smaller and um, then we'll put a um, put a uh, draw the foot on it first and get the outside shape the way we want and then we'll start hauling it. There's two cuts that um, thanks that uh, David does that I think are really worth noting. There's one on the outside, a shear scrape that he does that gets things very, very sharp or very clean. And then there's a cut that he does on the inside and um, that is literally like a skew working on a spindle. Uh, the thing that's um, true about this is I'm a left-handed turner and uh, it's a right-handed cut and what what that basically I learned in the afternoon was how to be a right-handed or left-handed turner. Now the reason 
that that works is when you're turning correctly, you're using your body to do the movement. So it doesn't matter. Your hands are just tool holders. You're like this, or you're like this. And after I caught on to it, part of the cut was better right-handed, the other part of the cut was better left-handed. And so I just switch it up, finish it off. And um, that's, it, it's something that's worth figuring out if you only use one hand when you're cutting. Because like you noticed when I was <coughs> roughing this out, I was doing a left-handed. But I was over here making my cuts. And that basically puts me out of the line of fire. And uh, <coughs> when I... Mean, I who were in the line of fire? Huh? We were in the line of fire. Yeah, you guys were. Yeah. That's true. But then when I'm cutting on the inside, <coughs> as you'll see, left-handed, I have to crawl over here and walk around the lathe, which is what I was doing to start with. And he was kind of shaking his head like... How the heck did you get back there? And I said, well, I'm left-handed. And finally, I started trying to do that finishing cut that he does. And he says, you're going to have to figure out how to use your right hand. <laughs> and so he gave me some ideas and sent me back to my leg, and I figured it out. So anyway, and now we got this thing in the chuck. And um, what I can see right off the bat is that the front is um, not square, so I think I'll clean it up. I don't think I can. I can't get this the hell out of the way. So I'll clean this up a little bit just to make it flat so I can see where the top is going to be. And that's a little too high.
How does this work for the knob? Alright, now I got that in the way that's handy. Alright. That's one thing I can say about these power craft blades. You know, that's flexible as a layout set. You just have to know what you want. Okay, so what I'm going to start doing here is hollow the bowl. And basically, it's just go up the center. So here's where 
David's cut is just like the coolest thing in the world. Basically, the tool will go in here like this, and you're just kind of like riding along right here. You ha this is a right-handed cut. There's no other way to do it, at least with the blade set up this way, because we have to look tenderly. And what happens is that you run into this ridge here, and it just starts cutting, and it takes it away. And um, I just thought that was really cool. <laughs> I went back and turned shallow bowls for a day just to let them figure that out. <laughs> so, uh, see how much it took out? I need to do it again, but it's almost there. Just one, one pass. And it's caught in one. Okay, there it is. See, it, it just cleaned it up. It's just amazing. Now I've got to finish the inside here. Um, and basically, I'm going to do that left handed. I might switch gouges here. Yeah. yeah, let's switch gouges. No. So you, you're using more of the wings of that sharpened edge as opposed to the point? Yeah. Yeah, and it really has to be sharp, sharpened with this jig to get it. And it has to be a parabolic blue. I, I bruised my rib literally with this gouge sharpened that way but I had a bad catch and it came in here and whacked me. And, uh, Ever so often for about a month, they go. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to clean up the bottom using this guy. But anyway, wood. that's, it's wood. that's yeah. where, that's the two cuts that I thought that he did that were the most unique. Um, to finish this off, you know, you're going to have to sand it. And I was taught you couldn't sand green wood. We can sand green wood. Uh, but you have to use that Abernath sanding mesh. And it won't fill up. It'll, you can go clear down to 800 grit. That's how far you want to go. And it'll, you'll just clean it up, polish it up just like it was a piece of dry wood. You set it off in the corner and let it dry. Um, so, but let's say that we had what we wanted in here. And I don't. <laughs> but, um, Vegetable, isn't it? And uh, it 
basically what happens, this is what I think happens, it's like boiling the wood, but what happens is it breaks the cell walls or something, it releases the bound water and lets it come out with the free water. And so you don't have nearly the cracking, and you don't get as much warping either, which if you want the warping, then you have to decide. But anyway, it, it, it does work. But you can't do it too many times. I had a piece of cottonwood out of this very same tree, and it's going, let's see if we can get this all dry today. And on about the fifth time, I went, that's not steam, <laughs> that's smoke. <laughs> and I had to shut it down and run it outside before it caught everything on fire. But, uh, so you got to be a little careful with the microwave. Um, there's other ways to do it. Putting them in a paper bag seems to work. Putting them in a plastic bag seems to work if it's just a little bit open. So the water kind of gets out slow, but the key is a constant temperature and the water not coming out too fast. That is the essence behind it. Um, so, anyway, that, let's say we wanted a smaller foot on this guy. Well, we just go in and start putting our foot on it. And I'm using this table gouge here. Now what I am doing is I'm leaving, leaving the, uh, the strength of what holds the, the wood in there is basically these uh, dovetails pushing on, the, uh, on this part here. So I'm not cutting that off because you want that left on so it doesn't fly off like I already showed you how that works. <laughs> And then, um, the, I don't really like this. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> 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 I 
But, uh, you know, that started me on a bit of entry. That way, we just chunk the wood and trim the tail stock and cut it off, and that's why I've always done it. And, you know, you, you just get stuck in your way sometimes. You need somebody to kick it and do it a different way. <laughs> but that's how I do it. About it. Nice piece of wood for cottonwood. Actually, you know, if you make very many bowls, cottonwood makes a pretty nice bowl because they're light and they're really strong. There's, I think, the fibers are like this in there, and you can just throw them on the floor and they just bounce back and smile. And uh, so they do make a good bowl. Uh, Sometimes the wood can be really boring because it's just white, um, and that's when you need to either not turn that piece of wood to start with or decorate it with some, some, in some manner with the wood burning or milk paint or who knows, there's plenty of ways to do that. So, 